Hey everyone, it's me, the Inner Nerd, and yes, I'm back. After having most of the year away from the bench since I've been moving house and workshop, it's time for me to return with the Kinetic's new Harrier. So, it's good to be back, <laughs> and I've really been looking forward to this build ever since I got it last year. And in this video I'm going to cover basically everything I can about the kit. I'll start off by showing you how some of it builds up, and then I'm going to move on to some key points I've been asked while I've been away about airbrushing. Then as usual I'll be weathering this thing, and then we'll have the final reveal. So let's get into it. So this kit is effectively a 2 in 1, offering 2 GR1s and 5 GR3 versions of the Harrier. I'll be building option number 6 which is a GR3 from HMS Hermes. Straight out of the box you get 7 main sprues, 1 clear and 1 sheet of photo etch. Then we have the decals, quite a big sheet for this one and well printed, all the carrier film is quite small and they're really glossy so it should go down well. Before I start any build I always carefully read through instructions first. I make sure to highlight any options in green, and then any small parts that I'll be leaving off later in the build will be highlighted in pink. These are things like aerials and clear parts like lights and the canopy. The seat is pretty much the same as what you get in every other kit, and the two R's fit together quite nicely. On the smaller parts of the model I like to use a combination of both regular and extra thin cement. The seat looked a little bit too plastic for my liking, so I decided to use VMS's paper shaper. Normally used for armour models to replicate tarpaulins, the paper shaper combines a thin layer of what I can only describe as special paper and some sort of chemical to soften it. I left the paper chemicaling for about 5 minutes before applying it directly to the seat. Then with a set of tweezers, manipulated the paper about a bit until it had some creases, like the cover on the real seat. Then I left that to dry for about a day. Whilst the seat cover was drying, I cut the main parts of the fuselage from the sprue. Kinetic have thought about this as well, which is nice. The gates are located on the back, not to damage the joining surfaces when they're removed. Nice. What wasn't so nice was the ejector pin mark on the back side of the bulkhead. This was also the frontmost wall of the gear bay, so I quickly scraped that away with a scalpel blade. To make it easier to paint the wheels, I opened up a hole through the entire nose wheel hub. That would allow me to place a toothpick through to create a spinny thing. I couldn't go through the rear wheels, so I just used PVA glue to place another toothpick in the hub for another spinny thing. Considering I was wanting to make this out of the box, I'm not starting off very well. I wanted to add some more detail into the ejector seat, so I used a combination of solder wire and braided line from NEZ. For all of the parts that aren't plastic from the sprue, I use VMS's super glue range. They've got a full range for all different types of material, but the main ones I use are slow dry as it's a bit thicker, then extra thin because, well, it's thinner. But if you're looking to upgrade or change your super glue, I highly recommend VMS. Good stuff. To add in details like hydraulic or airlines, I tend to drill out a start point and an end point whether this be on a seat or in a gear bay. It gives the wire something positive to align and stick to. Next up was the photo etch. I briefly sanded these to rough them up a bit using 2000 grit sanding sponge. You can also use a naked flame to burnish them and remove their springiness. It's also a good idea to cut the parts off the fret with something solid underneath. The cutting mat is a bit too spongy and you don't get as clean a cut. Here I'm using a slate coaster for my sponsor, the Oxted Model Centre. Their link is in the description below and that's where I get all my kits and equipment from. Go check them out. Back to more not out of the box building with the foot pedals. The kit ones are a bit soft and missing any sort of texture, so I 3D printed some of my own to replace them. Bit pointless since you don't even see them, but faffing about with the printer was quite fun. Before I start any airbrushing, I just want to go over the setup that I use. If you're new to airbrushing then this might be of some use to you. You'll hear a lot of people saying that the best airbrushes are the most expensive, which is kind of true, but I think a great excuse to justify getting one. 
The airbrush that I started off with I actually still have. It's this one from Sealy, it's called the AB9321, which is a dual action gravity feed brush. This means that the paint container or pot is at the top of the airbrush and gravity feeds it into the flow of air to spit it out at the end of the nozzle. As you can see on the older Sealy, the nozzle cap can be removed, but not the nozzle itself, so you can't really get to it for cleaning. Now I've replaced this airbrush for a Harder and Steenbeck Evolution Silverline. This is mainly due to the cleaning and maintenance because the assembly of the Steenbeck is much more efficient to strip down and clean thoroughly. The overall operation of these airbrushes are exactly the same, so paint is added to the container at the top, then flows down via gravity into the flow of air. The more you pull back on the trigger, the more paint will flow through. Hopefully you can see that the assembly of the Steenbeck allows for a full strip down of the airbrush. This is better for cleaning and also swapping out parts. I am currently running a 0.15mm needle and nozzle with an air pressure which does vary and I'll cover that when we reach the painting stage. A question that I'm sure you might be asking yourself is why not just go ahead and get an Infinity, not an Evo. So the main reason is that the Evolution Silverline has a different O-ring to the others in the H&S range. This allows for a more aggressive thinners such as cellulose to be used and not eat away at that seal. Plus the Infinity is getting on for about twice this price. Cutting back to the action, I lay down the first lot of primer on the sub-assemblies I made earlier. For the primer I use AK's primer with micro filler and I'm using the black. This primer is actually pre-thin for the airbrush so no need to add any thinners. I spray the primer slightly higher pressure than the paint at 12 psi. I spray the primer at a slightly further distance than I would paint too. This is around 100 to 150 mil away from the model to cover the larger area. With all of the sub-assemblies primed in the black primer, I move on to paint the interior. Here I use Gunship Grey to highlight some panels on the ejector seat. Most paints, including the AK Real colours I have here, have to be thinned. A good way to test just how thin the paint needs to be is to test it on something other than the model. I use my trusty glove and spray a small area and assess the perimeter. If there are small spatters, then the paint is more likely to be too thick. It should be a nice even feather fading into the surrounding area. It's actually surprising how thin the paint needs to be to reach that level. Now that I have the highlights with the gunship grey, I use raw oil paints to dry brush and pick out the highest spots which would catch more light. I find dry brushing is a bit of an art. A stiff brush is best, load the brush with paint, then remove most of it on a paper towel. Once the brush is barely transferring any paint at all, it's probably at the right level. Then it's all about a delicate touch to highlight the most risen areas of the part you are highlighting. The outside shell of the seat was done, so I moved on to hand painting in the details of the cushions and belts. To bring out and also add a shadow, I use a brown coloured wash from Ammo. These washes are already thin to add to the model straight from the pot, but to reduce its intensity on this one, I added a small amount of thinner, which in my case is white spirit, to soften the contrast. <laughs> 
Continue in the cockpit, I used AK Real Colors Gunship Grey again to block out the base colour. I spray these paints at 10 PSI and the thinned as I mentioned before. For the Harrier accuracy nerds out there, the medium gunship grey is actually the wrong colour, and it should be dark admiralty grey according to various resources. But this looked close enough to the references I was following for the cockpit, so went ahead. There aren't any decals for the instrument panel, so I had to paint them in. It's easier to thin the paint and almost drop the colour into the dial like a drop of ink. To finish the panel off, I dry brush with a lighter grey oil, like I did with the ejector seat. I think that the cockpit painting is one of my weaker areas of modelling. So to make picking out the details a little easier, I use these paint pens. These are from Uniball and come in a range of primary colours, so we're able to pick out most of the switch gear inside the cockpit. Up to now I've only used matte finish paints, so to add the glass detail into the dials, I add a drop of Tamiya clear gloss into each dial face by hand. The clear part for the heads up display screen was quite thick, so I swapped this out with a scratch built version using evergreen styrene sheet. This one's about a third of the thickness of the moulded part. In the kit supply decals, there were none for the ejector seat placards. So I used generic ones from NZ to replicate them instead of leaving the seat blank. The kit has been designed so that all four nozzles are connected and poseable using this mechanism that sits inside the fuselage. It is quite tricky to fit though and can cause the two halves of the fuselage to not marry up correctly. So after a bit of test fitting I decided to leave this part out altogether and fit the nozzles manually late in the build. Without that nozzle thing in there, the two parts of the fuselage went together a treat. I find it best to make the two halves in stages, making sure each section is aligned, then glued before moving on. On my kit, the wingtips didn't fit together all that great, and I had to thin them down quite considerably for them to mate with the upper section and align well enough. You can see that when compared with the untouched side that I've had to take away about half the thickness to allow it to be level with the top section. Thankfully, for those of us that have built the Hasegawa Harrier kit, the wings fit into the spine of the fuselage really quite well. I built the Hasegawa Harrier GR9 a while back on the channel, and this area was a real nightmare to align. I did use a bit of filler on this joint to try and smooth out the gap. I mixed a small amount of water into the putty as this one can be quite stubborn if not thin. What I like about using perfect plastic putty is that you can leave it to dry a little, then rub away the excess with the damp cotton bud or something along those lines. This leaves only the filler in the gap remaining, leaving no clean up. The main part of the build is now complete and it's time to add some primer and get painting. But before that, I'd like to talk about this. It's available at my website www.theinnernerd.com. This is my latest invention and something us aircraft modelers desperately need. It's a third hand. Nah, just kidding, it's a model jig. 
So this is something I use on every build and have designed it to hold any type of aircraft using this unique slider system. It allows the overall dimensions to be adjusted to suit the model you're building. Both the actual platform can be adjusted in X and Y as well as the upright supports for the wings and fuselage, allowing it to follow the profile of, dare I say, every aircraft. Each support can be adjusted independently to fit the specific shapes of whatever you're building. There are also two heads for the fuselage support. This nodule type one is made to fit into the gear bay, locking it in place securely. Then a Y-frame one to allow the model to be flipped on its back for working underneath. If you'd like one of these and also support my video making at the same time, head over to my website www.theinnernerd.com to take a look. I'm not the kind of channel that offers branded merch, so this is the best that I can offer. Suppose it's better than a mug, eh? Back from product placement land, I drill a hole in the top of each of the weapon's pylons. This is so I can make a spinny thing just like I did for the wheels earlier. Then it was time to add some primer. I started off with a grey primer to highlight any defects in the build. Black primer is a bit too dark for this job, so that's why I'm using grey to start with. As always, there are a few areas to take a look at, so I went back round these, reworking them with filler and sanding them as I did with the main build. To rough up the surface and get rid of any unsightly marks, I quickly sand over the entire model with 2000 grit sanding sponge before the main primer. I did notice some lost detail in the surface whilst doing this, so I used a combination of the razor saw, this one's from JLC, a rescribe tool which is from somewhere I can't remember, and the Hasegawa tri tool which I use as a template. In my last video, model making for beginners, I mentioned in relative detail about paint thinning, so to elaborate a little more I'm going to talk about the paints that I use and how I thin them ready for airbrushing. The paints that I use the most and that I've already used in this video are AK Interactive Real Colours. I've used several paints from just as many brands and these are my absolute favourites. They're acrylic lacquers so aren't fully water based and are best thin with their own branded thinner. And that's a general rule for other paints too. If you can, try to use a matching brand thinner to what you have paint for best compatibility. Although that rule can be bent ever so slightly with Mr Hobby, as their aqueous colour can be thinned just as well using their self-levelling thinner designed for their lacquer paints. Last up in my arse and all is Tamiya Acrylics, probably the most easily available paints in the modelling world for sure. Be careful which thinner you use for these because Tamiya makes two versions of the X20. There is an A version like this one which is for the acrylics, then there is a plain X20 which is for enamels, don't mix them up. So you've got a new pot of paint and it needs thinning for the airbrush. Open up the brand new pot and fill the paint to just under the top level of the neck. This will make them more suitable for the airbrush straight out of the pot. There will need to be more thinning after that, but this is a good start. Moving on to primers and I'm sticking with AK. I use their primer with micro filler which is available in the three colours you'd need. It's also pretty thin for the airbrush which is a massive positive over something like Mr Surfacer which needs about a minimum of 50% before you can even start. If you prefer Mr Surfacer there are plenty to choose from. They're all graded in levels of thickness, so the higher the number, the thinner it will be. The best thing with self-leveling thinner, starting at around about 50% and working up from there. If I had to pin it down to a ratio, I'd say about 70% thinner in these. Quickly turning to cleaning out the airbrush after use, I go cheap and bulk buy IPA. Sadly, this isn't the beverage type. Finally, we have metallics. Again, I'm back with AK Interactive and their extreme metal colours. These are pre-thin for the airbrush and are enamel base. To enable me to do the normal black basing technique I use, I first need to lay down the black base. I first laid down a dust coat, which isn't too thick to etch itself onto the model. This was followed immediately by a thicker wet coat to build up the opacity of the primer layer. I also sprayed the inside of the canopy so that it could be sealed in place before the main painting began. To stop the canopy from fogging, I use a small amount of VMS Extra Thin Superglue. The superglue doesn't heat up in the same way poly cement does when fusing the parts together, so it's ideal for clear parts like canopies. I did however drop a massive ghoulie when putting on the windshield part. There was a bump kind of thing here which I thought was flash and then cut it off, so that meant I had to somehow build it back up. 
The first and rather crap idea I had was to build some sort of bridge of styrene strips, then I would use filler around it to blend it in. That didn't work so I went back to the drawing board and came up with something even crapperer. This is a 3D printed part of styrene which was meant to have shaped to the form of the model. Yeah. Then my older modelling brain kicked in and I remembered I had some green stuff with poxy putty. I mixed the two parts together using some water so I didn't get stuck to it and then applied this, smoothing it out into the surrounding area. I knew it wouldn't be as good as the part I'd cut off, but at least it would blend into the rest of the model once I'd sanded it down and into shape. So after hitting it with some 8 and 1200 sandpaper, I covered it in primer to see if the edges were feathered enough into the rest of the surface. They weren't quite there so I used Mr Dissolve Putty to fill in these cracks. The putty dried faster than the epoxy, so this was a quick turnaround to feather in the edge sufficiently. After that detour it was time to roughly mark out the camouflage pattern. The scheme I was going for is Modeler's Nightmare, the RAF wraparound. I printed off a 1 to 1 scale drawing of the scheme I found online and cut out the individual shapes to trace onto the model surface. To start the painting I blocked in the first colour using REF Dark Green from AK Real Colours. This paint was thinned in the method I showed before plus another 30% thinner, so this mix is around 50-50 to enable me to make the mottling effect. Starting the mottling layer I first pass over the area in a random pattern. I keep both air and paint flow consistent throughout, wiggling my way around the area of interest. The effect will depend on how open you spread the pattern as well as the distance the airbrush is away from the model. A tight pattern will create a cleaner and more uniform finish, whereas an open pattern will leave the black showing through more, meaning it will look more broken and worn when we come to blend it together. The distance of the airbrush also has the same effect. The closer to the model the more broken the pattern will become if you don't keep the pattern tight, and vice versa for spraying further away and opening up the pattern, so it's a delicate balance to get the result and the effect that you want to achieve. Next up is to blend those tones together. I use the same mix of paint and same air pressure at 10psi to add another layer. In this layer I'm aiming to fill the gaps from the first as well as go over the already existing colour to make that more opaque. This creates multiple tones at the same colour, creating an uneven paint finish similar to what you see on the real aircraft. This method kind of acts like a pre-weathering all over the model. Since the scheme was a wraparound, getting the edges to follow the form of the model would be tricky. To do this I used Office Blue Tack to create the boundaries between the green and grey yet to come. Then I painted the grey using the same method as I did with the green, laying down a model to begin with, followed by a blending layer to unify the colour. Hopefully you can see that the distance from my airbrush to the model is below around 10mm. This is to keep the pattern tight and create more texture in the colour using the black base. The pressure and paint flow are constant during this as they were with the green to help keep the pattern fluid. The paint is also thin just so that I can spray this close without any spatter or runs. I also try to keep within the boundaries of each panel to create a slightly darker panel line. When I go over this with the blending coat it will almost disappear, but will be very slightly darker than the surrounding area. Now we can see a bit clearer, the blending coat only just covers the previous coat, unifying the grey over the black. You can faintly see the darker areas, but only just. The main colour blocking is now complete, now I move on to smaller details before getting ready for the clear coat. Looking closer at the decal decals, depending on where you're from, the roundel on the air intake was split up into several parts because of the opening doors for hover mode. I saw this and thought of a potentially better way using masks. I got this new contraption from Dispay and it's some sort of torture device which doubles up as a circle cutter. It's extremely well made, 
and has a tungsten blade fitted to a cylinder bearing. You can set the depth of the cut as well as the diameter of the circle using the scale on the side. Then it's a case of measuring the circle you want to cut and go for it. You can't guarantee where it will cut, but it does do a very good job of cutting out a smooth circle. To paint the roundels I wanted to match the colour of the decals I'll be used elsewhere on the model. I painted some spoons as a tester to see what mix of blue would be needed. Long story short, Tamiya X3. Then to get a nice vibrant colour and replicate the base of the spoon test, I primed the area in white before popping the X3 over the top. With that done I needed to create a gloss coat which would seal in all the paintwork and prep for the decals. To do this I use Super Clear 3 mixed with self leveling thinner at around 70% thinner. I do find this mix is quite aggressive on fresh paint, so I leave the main paintwork to dry until the next day, then spray a very fine dust coat of the clear before applying further wet coats at least 45 minutes later. The wet coats take advantage of the self leveling properties of the thinner and can dry very smoothly once built up thick enough. The wet coat is allowed to dry for about an hour before I apply the next. I make three wet coats to prepare for the decals. Whilst I was waiting for the clear coats to dry, I built and painted the auxiliaries starting with the aftermarket set of Paveway LGBs. Even though the instructions say that this particular GR3 carries the Paveway 2 bomb, it's not included with the kit. I know that the accuracy police will probably be screaming at the screen right now, but I did do a bit of research and it turns out the Harrier did carry laser guided bombs, specifically to my research the GBU-16. There is another bomb which is very similar called the CPU-123, but again in the extract shown on screen and linked in the description, does state that the GBU-16 is a paved way too, so that was good enough for me. The pylon attachment holes need to be put on the aftermarket bombs, so to get the location of the holes correct, I use a paint pen to transfer their location and alignment. Moving on to the exhaust, I base them in AK's Extreme Metal Jet Exhaust colour before adding a layer of Alcleg Copper. The copper would be used to create the more red tones I saw in the metal of the exhaust I was copying. A layer of Ammo's chipping fluid would then be laid on the top of this base to allow for the steel main colour to be worn away. I only added one layer of the chipping fluid since I didn't want to take off too much paint by accident. This was to only scratch away the surface rather than fully remove the top layer of steel. Immediately after the steel layer had dried I wet the area with just regular water, then waited a couple of minutes before agitating with a soft bristled toothbrush. And because I didn't want to remove too much paint, I tapped the surface rather than scrubbed. This would remove speckles rather than blocks of the top colour. The copper was a little too strong coming through the steel, so I used titanium which is a little more yellow than the steel to softly blend the two other colours together. Next I pick out some exhaust soot colours between the nozzle veins. I started with a deep grey wash from ammo. This was applied straight onto the paint surface without any clear coats in between. To deepen this effect in texture, I added a black panel line wash slightly deeper into the nozzle than I did with the grey. This would emulate thick as soot. Any blotches caused by the wash after drying were cleaned up with a small amount of enamel thinners to soften the blend. After that I moved on to the landing gear and used liquid mask from VMS to cover the landing light lens. This was followed by AK's chrome to add the mirror onto the back of the lights before it was coated in the white of the undercarriage. 
The tyres were easier to paint by hand. I used black for this and thinned the paint just before application into a more ink-like consistency. This would make it easier to paint right up to the wheel hub. Returning to the payload, I mix a green colour to match that of the RAF version of the paveway since the American one is different. I found that a mix of 80% RAF dark green and 20% Tamiya X3 gave a pretty good match. I wanted to add a bit more interest on the payload and noticed that some aircraft carried unmatching fuel tanks. These must have been taken from the Sea Harrier FRS as they were a mix of dark sea grey and barley grey. Ok, back to the main event. The clear coat had dried by now, so it was time to apply the decals. Once the decals had been applied, I waited until the next day before sealing them in with two coats of Super Clear 3, just like I did when prepping for the decals earlier in the video. Even though the clear coat is thin with levelling thinner, there's still a small amount of orange peeling which I like to sand smooth. To do this I use 2000 grit sanding sponge and gently buff away at the top layer of clear varnish. This will level the surface and also set us up for the weathering. Kicking off the weathering effects are what I assume to be repair marks. To replicate this I thin 6RP black, which is not quite absolute black, to around 80% thinner. This will allow me to spray incredibly close to the model without much spatter from the airbrush and keep the lines tight. Lucky for me is that the repair jobs didn't seem all that neat, so my wobbling hand actually added to the authenticity. The next effect was to lay down some wear and tear around the engine access panels on the spine. Since these were mainly hand prints containing soot and oil, I used the blue dirt wash from ammo which is a slightly darker grey than the camouflage scheme. I'm not going for a full overall wash on this model because when I was looking at references I was going to use for the weathering, I noticed that most of the aircraft, bar a few key areas, were actually kept quite clean. Instead I used this spot wash technique by applying a wash all oil to a specific area, then thin directly on the model to blend it into the surrounding area. Here what I've done is to let the oil dry until there are no wet spots. Then add a small amount of enamel thinner to agitate the wash into position, as well as feather the edges so it blends in around the panel line. I wanted to add these streaks coming from the vortex things on the wings. To do this I used a mix of black, industrial earth and white oils to mix a dark grimy colour. To apply and streak these oils I use a fine tip brush to firstly apply the oil accurately, then the streaking would be created using an angled flat brush as well as a sort of finger brush thing which would be able to drag the oil along the surface. The thinner for all the weathering effects that I'm using is white spirit, which is an oil and enamel thinner. Also it's worth noting that all these effects are possible due to the fact that the model is now a satin finish after the flat sanding I did after the decals. A gloss surface wouldn't allow for the oils to stick as well, making any sort of streaking difficult to achieve. To actually streak the oils I add a small amount of thinner to the flat brush so that it's only dampened. Then using very delicate pressure, drag the oil backwards in the direction of airflow. It will take a couple of passes to get the oils in position. I use exactly the same method on other key areas to show individual streaks. 
I vary the colour slightly between dark grey and a sort of grimy colour to show the different leaks around the aircraft. Using the same oil mix as the streaks, I picked out some panel lines on the engine access panel again. This time it would be darker than the blue dirt I used before, so it would add some more contrast and texture to that area. To blend the oil and make it less stark, I added a small amount of thinner like I did before. This dissipates the oil slightly and begins to feather it into the background, as well as spread it along the panel line. After a few passes with the brush, you can push the oil into the direction you want it to go, leaving like a dirty residue behind, as though the panel has been handled a few times by the ground crew. This effect requires a bit of patience as the oil might not go in the direction or blend as well as you'd hoped. The key is to keep manipulating the oil and keep the brush relatively clean so you don't just make the mix into a wash over the larger area. In this more open shot you can hopefully see that there's a lot of to and fro in between manipulating the oil, cleaning the brush and returning to the model. Adding too much thinner to the area will make it disappear, so dab the brush on the paper towel so the brush is only damp and not wet. I continue this method all over the areas I've spotted on my reference images. I keep changing the colour ever so slightly to get a wider range of tone, as not all the areas will be the same colour on the real aircraft. The spy needed some more work after I'd done the spot detailing, so I made an area of dirt using the blue dirt wash I started with, adding it to an area rather than a longer panel line. After that had gone dry with no wet spots, I used a stipple brush which was dampened with thinner like I had previously, but this time I prodded at the model to break up the area of wash. This would create a more choppy effect as some areas of the wash would be removed by the brush, but not all of them. Now normally I would advise against using a black wash, since a deep black is never really seen in weathering, it's usually more realistic to use a dark brown or blue instead. But for this one I was trying to replicate what I think is the soot from the backdraft of the engines, which is black. To help spread the wash over a larger area I preloaded the model with a pure enamel thinner, then added dots of the wash into the area so it would break apart and spread. Then I broke the wash apart with the stipple brush I used before. The brush is dry at this point so some of the oil is removed when the brush passes over. This creates a choppy effect like what I made on the spine just now. I left that to dry so there were no wet spots. Then went and blended the more concentrated areas with the pointed brush loaded with enamel thinner. This breaks them apart and removes any splodges. To add some more texture to that effect I use a pre-mix wash from Ammo. This one is to replicate engine oil and general grime and would work well with a black base coat. This wash also dries glossy so there will be a nice contrast of finishes to the overall matte we've got right now. I applied that in the same way as I did the black wash and blended it in to look choppy. The oil weathering was now complete so I added some finer details starting with scratches using a toothpick. I gently scratch away at the surface to reveal the cleaner paintwork underneath. Now it's time for the final assembly. All of the small parts would now be added to the model using VMS's extra thin and slow dry superglues. 
Oh, one more thing. I added some heat stains and soot to the heat shields behind the rear nozzles. The first colour I put down was jet exhaust, followed by burnt metal to add some darker, more bronze tones in there. I finished this off with clear blue and yellow from Tamiya, but the footage wasn't all that great because I either had my head in the way or the top of the wing. As the build comes to a close, it starts a new section I'm going to add to my videos. Should you avoid, shortlist or buy this kit? I'm going to cut straight to the chase on this and recommend you buy this one right now. The fit is great, the subject is even better and overall it's what I like out of a build. It's enjoyable and I hope you enjoyed it with me too. Thanks for watching, this has been Kinetics 148 scale Harrier GR3. <laughs>like to say thank you to all my patreon supporters for helping me keep this channel moving forward if you'd like to join them then why not sign up we have a discord chat where i share live updates and on-demand help if you need it as well as being part of a tight-knit community of modelers if you enjoyed this video drop me a like or even subscribe if you want to go big i've got more videos like this coming over the next year now that i'm all set up in my modeling studio again until then keep yourself safe and happy modeling